The Order 1886 was released back in early 2015 by Ready at Dawn Studios for the PlayStation 4 and was met by heavy criticism. I never bought it upon its initial release and now my curiosity has finally gotten the better of me. I decided to play it to find out for myself if the game was truly as terrible as everyone was making it out to be. So with that out of the way, let's jump in. Shall we join the soirée? Let's invite a few friends, shall we? Air Command, this is Galahad. I need response from anyone in the vicinity of Whitechapel. The Order 1886 takes place during an alternate version of the late 19th century Victorian era London. Technology is far more advanced than it was during the same period within our own timeline. However, the technological advancements aren't the strangest part of the world. That title belongs to the half-breeds. Creatures evolved from humans, sharing their genetic makeup with both man and beast. The existence of half-breeds poses a threat to the human population, a potential risk of extinction. To combat this threat, many centuries ago, King Arthur created the Knights of the Round Table, more commonly known now as the Order and the war has raged on ever since. Throughout the game you play as Grayson, otherwise known as Sir Galahad, a knight of the aforementioned order, kept alive for several centuries by a substance known as Blackwater, as have the other knights of the order that accompany Sir Galahad on his journey. The Lord Chancellor is convinced of it. I have my doubts. Sebastian Mallory, or Sir Percival, former mentor to Grayson and knight of the order for over 600 years. I must admit, you do move fast for a man of your age. Isabeau de Argyle, or Lady Igraine, adopted daughter of the Lord Chancellor and hinted love interest of Grayson. Ah, Monsieur, uh, this lady requires my attention. Marquis. Gilbert de Mottier, or Marquise de Lafayette, Frenchman and protege to Sir Percival. From the get-go, the narrative hints at a betrayal committed by either Sir Galahad or by his peers, but the clock rewinds us back so that we can unravel the mystery for ourselves. Galahad, acknowledge this is command. I read you, Percival. You're enjoying a stroll in the park, are we? Nothing quite like a chilly London morning to stimulate the senses. Victorian era London makes for a stunning backdrop throughout the adventure. There were many times I had to stop and appreciate the sheer beauty of what was on display. The characters are no exception to this either. Clothing, facial detail, and hair are exceptionally well done. And the lighting of some sections is astounding. The game also opts for a more cinematic aspect ratio. Whilst it most certainly achieves its goal, it often restricts the visibility during gunfights, making some sections a nightmare. Some cutscenes further restrict the screen by adding a sort of vignette, although I can't recall this effect ever overlaying gameplay sections. The soundtrack of the game is excellent, filled with orchestral pieces that perfectly fit the tone and the setting. Many of them are even memorable, especially the night's theme, which is what you're currently listening to. The UI is also quite well designed. The aesthetic fits in nicely with the overall tone of the game, although some sections that require button prompts or quick time events can feel out of place at some points. It's almost as if they offer too much of a contrast against the gorgeous design of the world, although this only seems to be a noticeable problem during close up cinematic moments. I believe Mademoiselle requires our attention. Green, we're in position! About time! Move out! Mm -hmm. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of The Order 1886 often leaves much to be desired. Shooting feels satisfying for some of the more ordinary weapons, but I found that the more advanced and notable weapons left me feeling let down. For example, the Thermite Rifle is well designed in look and premise, but firing the weapon never felt impactful. Moving around the environment also feels sluggish. Moving out of cover often leads to an undesired result, such as vaulting when I wanted to push around the corner, and vice versa. Climbing feels slow, and every time Sir Galahad jumps to grab a ledge, the sound effect is delayed. As mentioned earlier, the cinematic screen can often hinder gunplay. Considering this game heavily relies on cover-based shooting, it seems strange that no one decided to change this during development. If the aspect ratio was such a requirement, why not zoom the camera out a bit? Having a camera so close to the player and then putting an object in the way makes it incredibly difficult to see where the enemies are. This may add a sense of realism, but realism does not always equal fun. Any fun that is had in the gunfight is quickly ruined by endless waves of enemies that are clearly put in place to pad out the game's runtime. The game's length is not the problem, the gameplay is. Most gunfights also play out in a very linear fashion. I'm a fan of linear narrative games, but this is ridiculous. The Order 1886 is in desperate need of open space, with a greater sense of option. There are several mini games as well, one is for lock picking and the other for circuit overloading. These are inconsequential to gameplay, but are fun nonetheless. Whilst on the subject of minigames, quick time events also feature heavily in the game. You encounter them in cutscenes, puzzles, when fighting lichens, and even during stealth sections. I'm not a person that has a great distaste for quick time events, but when they begin to stand in place of what could actually be gameplay, 
then there's a problem. And this is a problem that came up many times during my 6 hour playthrough. As I just mentioned, fighting lichens is a part of the game. Not a very substantial part, but it's there. These sections are by far the most disappointing aspect of the game. Much of what initially drew me to the Order 1886 was the premise of protecting London from creatures of the night. For one thing, these sections are very few and far between, and for the next, they are very poorly designed. These sections are cluttered with corners for the lichens to sprint out from, but rather than aiding in tension, I instead found it to be predictable, as the area was so restricted. The actual act of fighting them is also lackluster. You fight lichens in one of two ways, shooting them and then dodging in a fashion that is clunky at best, or by going toe to toe with them, which initially feels powerful and defiant, but only moments into my first experience I was met with more quick time events. The stealth sections that I briefly mentioned a moment ago are, to put it kindly, horrific. Quick time events don't just pop up occasionally during stealth gameplay, they are the stealth gameplay. Sneaking up behind an enemy, ready for the kill, only to have to wait and time your button press is infuriating. Especially when the enemy turns around before you're allowed to press the button, always resulting in immediate failure. This brings me to my next point, AI. The AI in the game is not good, not good at all. Enemies are constantly running all over the place, and some enemy types are so aggressive, often to the point that it becomes whimsical. Shotgun enemies think they can come and stand right next to you just because they have a shotgun, and heavy machine gun enemies are too beefy and bullish for the environments that they're put in. Where am I supposed to run to gain the upper hand on Westminster Bridge? It's a bridge! The AI of the allies isn't much better either. During my playthrough, I had characters stand in the open line of fire, walking to my line of fire, and even shoot at walls behind them. It also feels like they don't do anything. Why put them next to me in the first place if they're going to be completely pointless? Speaking of pointless, the game also features a mechanic that allows you to inspect certain objects within the environment. A prompt will appear allowing you to pick up and flip or rotate the objects. The mechanic itself isn't the problem, as other games utilise this feature, but in this game there is often no reason for it. It seems as though the developers are proud of what they have created, as though they should be, because this game is gorgeous but forcing you to rotate objects for no purpose at all is completely bizarre. At one point Sir Galahad picks up an apple to throw and distract a god, but when he picks it up, you have to inspect it. It's an apple for f**k's sake. There are also letters in the environment that you can pick up using this feature, and I wanted to read them to gain greater insight into this incredibly intriguing world that Ready at Dawn has created. But for many of them, the calligraphy is too good, and made it difficult to read. I would have liked to have had some way of viewing the script in some kind of block text. There are, however, phonograph cylinders that can be found throughout the environment. These cylinders are audio files that help to flesh out the state of the world and even the Knight's Order. They aren't essential to the story by any means, but are a welcome extra that helps to build the world. Gray, it hurts. Izzy, you'll be fine. I can't do this much longer. Not this life. Save your strength. We deserve. The premise of the Order 1886 is honestly, to me, fascinating. Being able to navigate a neo-Victorian London infested by half-breeds whilst playing a Sir Galahad, a knight of King Arthur's round table. It doesn't get much better for admirers of gothic fantasy of legend. The narrative that is woven for us isn't too shabby either. The hint of portrayal comes to a head quite nicely by the end of the game, and despite my distaste for the gameplay, I was eager to see where the story would lead next. The performances in the game are also excellent, so Galahad and the immediate posse are all fantastic. The only problem I did have with the acting came with the inconsistency within the phonographs. Many are excellent, but some feel overly dramatised for the material that they're working with. Sons and daughters of Britain, be merry and joyful. What did you find? Essex M86, thermite rifle. They saw their first field action a few weeks ago. Due to its linear nature, there isn't much to do upon the completion of the Order 1886. If you're desperate for more, or you really enjoyed a certain section of the game, there is a chapter select, which could also help you with finding collectibles. The trophy list is also rather standard, and it looks as though upon the initial completion of the game, a platinum trophy could be achieved within another 6 hours of gameplay, maybe less, as there's no trophies for completing the game on a certain difficulty. Further news of the uh, trouble in Grosvenor Square? Police are investigating. And investigating. Lichens. On the United India Company's front doorstep. What do you make? Mayfair isn't what it used to be. 
After the death of Sebastian Mallory, Grayson seeks out the rebel leader, a woman named Lakshmi. It's then revealed that the United India Company is the true threat, and not the rebellion. The United India Company is actually infested with vampires, and they plan to send a large portion of them to Northern America after the Order's recent successes. I love this small reveal. It may seem insignificant, but the possibilities within the world are now dramatically expanded. What else does this world contain? We later find that Alistair de Argyle, or Sir Lucan, who is also Isabeau's brother, is actually a half-breed, and is working with the United India Company to, in his words, protect his own kind. Within the same scene, it is also revealed that the chairman of the company, Lord Hastings, is a vampire, and is in fact the culprit of the recent murders within the Whitechapel district. Lord Hastings, or Jacob Van Neck, is Jack the Ripper. Again, this world that Ready at Dawn have crafted is utterly fantastical. So Galahad is bested, put to trial, stripped of his knighthood, and sentenced to death, thus returning us to the opening moments of the game. A short time after this, we seek to stop Sir Lucan, not only because he has betrayed the Order, but he also poses a threat to Nikola Tesla, the Order's armourer and Grayson's saviour after jumping into the Thames. You fight Alistair and you best him. Alistair explains how half-breeds have only ever fought to survive, yet at this point Grayson is somewhat conflicted, but I'm glad he doesn't throw himself to either side of the spectrum. It's important to see conflict here, hinting at larger themes of equality amongst humans and half-breeds for a potential sequel. The Lord Chancellor then appears and confesses that he knew of his son's condition from the moment he adopted him but knows that his son must die if the order is to continue. He hands Grayson the gun and walks away. Grayson raises the gun and the game prompts you to press R2 to shoot him. I understand that this fits with the game's use of quick time events, or interactive cutscenes, but I would have much rather seen a true cutscene, thus emphasising that I had no choice in the matter, that this was Grayson's only choice. Then the credits roll. There is an after credits scene that heavily implies that there will be a sequel, and I hope to God that there will be because Ready at Dawn have crafted too intriguing a world to leave it at that. Whilst I know that this game's stunning presentation can't make up for its less than mediocre gameplay, I also know that Ready at Dawn are capable of making great games, but until now they seem to have only done so with other people's IPs, and I really think they deserve another crack at it. Thanks for watching my review of The Order 1886, I hope you enjoyed it. Next week I'm going to do a video essay of sorts on how I believe a sequel for this game could work. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, subscribe. If you liked the video, leave a like, and if you didn't, that's okay, leave a dislike, or a comment and let me know how to improve. Alternatively, you could leave a comment and tell me what you thought of The Order 1886. Let's start a conversation. That's it for this video, ladies and gents, and I will see you in the next one.